This meeting is being recorded. <laughs> Good morning, friends, and you are friends. Welcome to Green for Life, uh, hosted by me, uh, Katsubi City Councilman Joshua Hadley. I'm also the treasurer of the Green Party of Alaska and uh, president of the Katsubi Chess Club. And uh, as uh, always, I'm joined by uh, John Olson in Maine. Hey, John, how's it going today? Uh, good morning, Josh. Good to see you there. Um, hope everybody is watching there on uh, Green Party of Alaska YouTube channel. And you can like and subscribe by uh, uh, following, I guess, the, the links provided and uh, staying informed. And uh, appreciate you being with us. I'm doing well today. That's fantastic. Um, so, uh, um, I, I guess uh, we'll just jump into the news right now, but we're all in a couple minutes after we uh, give you some updates. We're joined by um, transhumanist uh, I, Daniel. Uh, sorry, I got to go off my notes here. Daniel. Uh, Tweed, you can pronounce it. Tweed. Yeah. Tweed, exactly. <laughs> like a silent T uh, there. See, it's a sort of different last name, but hey, Daniel. Uh, so. Uh, we like to start the show. Uh, we we don't uh, exactly break the news here. We like to fix it. <laughs> and um, see, so, yeah, I don't like. I, I try not to. Sorry, everyone. I try not to be too Alaska centric. But um, you know, this is uh, produced by the Green Party of Alaska. The news out for our state budget is we're gonna spend less on everything. Well, you know, I mean that's the proposal anyway. I, there's no vote, but um, uh. The Republicans want to spend less on everything to give everyone a higher PFD. Um, so the permanent fund dividend. If uh, um, so to get if people don't understand what that is, if you ever watched the Simpsons movie, Homer and his family moved to Alaska, and you know they make the joke of uh, you know right when he pulls up in their pickup truck to or their car, whatever it is to you know, to drive in and move into the state, whoever's at the border hands them a thousand dollars. Like, Oh, here you go. You know? I, so the <laughs> idea is uh, every resident of the state gets this yearly PFD for, for just being a resident of the state. There's some rules, uh, some rules like uh, you gotta be in state happy or whatever, but that's the idea. You're a resident of Alaska and you get this PFD. Sometimes it's a thousand. It's under that. Their proposal is uh, three thousand dollars, and it originated back in the seventies when we were getting a whole bunch of oil money, and people were saying, "Let's not just you know spend it on whatever right away. Let's create a uh, permanent fund dividend. Uh, you know, do some investing, grow the money, and actually, right now, um, most of what pays for our state uh, funding isn't actually from oil." It's from these investments, like, um, for example, uh, um, I don't know every company we're invested in, but Alaska owns shares in companies like uh, Nintendo in Japan, companies, well, most of the companies are in America, but there's a whole bunch of companies like in Asia, China and Japan, for example, like I just pointed out. So that's actually where a lot of the money comes in. Um, and, and if uh, I'm what I'm worried about is if we keep spending and spending, you know, we're going to have to sell shares of these companies and, you know, we're going to eventually end up with nothing. Um, yeah. So uh, that's, that's the news, um, for on the PFD, we, uh, um, you know, it's not, it's not decided, you know, and a lot, I, I believe, uh, from when, when I started paying attention to it, our budget uh, talks are like uh, sort of like what's happening in the federal Congress, right? Well, Congress, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> it's it's we're talking about the state Congresses and the uh, federal government, like in trying to, <laughs> to, you know, talking about both of them. But, uh, you know, it's sort of like uh, in the federal government where they talk about these things and decide everything last minute, <laughs> you know, so it, nothing's decided right now. Um but uh, John, was there? Uh, did he have any comments? And do you have a story for? Or yeah, yeah, a little bit, a little, little bit here. I just got a post this morning from James Roguski, who has been a tiger on the issue of the WHO and their attempt to uh, dictate uh, medical f 
procedures for the whole world. And uh, he, he says that there's a, uh, there is no officially approved representative. The, the WHO is meeting, I guess, tomorrow for a few days. And, and there's supposed to be uh, whoever is nominated to be um, the U.S. representative is supposed to be confirmed by the Senate. But there, Joe Biden has nominated the attorney, not the attorney, the uh, uh, I guess it's the, um, the the top medical person, the 46 year old guy. But never was submitted to the Senate, so uh, he can't officially be the representative. So it's just one more one more thing to to try to uh, make them follow their own rules. Uh, and anyway, this the whole WHO thing is is. Uh, uh, a monumental issue for us all. It's a mortal a threat to, to uh, both our sovereignty, personal and as well as national, uh, and our, our personal lives as well. So that's that's kind of uh, in the news. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it's terrible when governments uh, decide, oh, we have the power and we don't get to. Um... You know, we get to just do whatever we want without, you know, a due process. Uh, and I guess I th that goes into our next uh, segment or well, our next little news segment before we get to our guest. Uh, um, you know, uh, what I found out was um, between this show and our last one is there's this is going to be the biggest year in democracy in 2024. More elections than ever happening around the world. Um, you, you know, right. we saw... Yeah, we saw uh, Taiwan just had their elections. China was very upset. Uh, El Salvador has their uh, elections happening, and it's quite worrisome. You know, they seem to, the president seems to be going against the term limits. I mean, you, you know, the, the, it's not like Taiwan where it just happened, but it's uh, upcoming. And, it, it, you know, uh, and there, there's another thing, uh, just like you're saying, a uh, person in power saying, you know, I'm not going to follow the rules. I'm just going to do things the way I want. And it is quite worrisome. Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, I think, over 100 countries have presidential elections this year. Speaking of which, uh, Jill Stein is the presumptive nominee of the Green Party. And uh, she's now asking for uh, people to, to contribute because if she can get uh, five thousand dollars from twenty states, then she qualifies for federal matching funds. So that's her news, and she's putting out requests for that. But again, you know, presumptive nominee. There are other people that are running, and perhaps we ought to have some debates over that. But so that's my contribution yeah, there. Absolutely. So um, yeah, we spent a lot. You know, we try to spend. Uh, to uh, to our viewers, just try to spend ten minutes on the news. But uh, we're joined by a guest today, a, a someone who's been a political candidate. He's run for city council. Um, he's a radio. He's been a radio host, a transhumanist. Uh, he's worked on this thing called Perma Trails. We're gonna be asking him about that. Uh, Daniel Tweed from uh, California. Hi, how's it going, Daniel? Hey, pretty good. My dad always said, uh, you know, I would move to Alaska if I was a young guy. So I guess I'm kind of <laughs> getting uh, to do it virtually here. But yeah, go go Alaska. And thanks for the chance to to be on on your uh, program. Absolutely. Uh, so, um, Daniel, uh, I, I'm just wondering, uh, why don't you give us a little bit of a background? Uh, so were you born and raised in California? Um, uh, yeah, native uh Californian, um, born in Inglewood, grew up in Manhattan Beach, and uh, now living in Thousand Oaks, uh, California. Um, so yeah, it's it's you know great to be in a state that's so uh, you know like a like a major superpower almost. I think the GDP wise, it's, <laughs> it qualifies as the fifth or sixth uh, mm. you know biggest uh, GDP entity. But uh, yeah, we're having problems in California with the. We have a mandated balanced budget, and uh, looks like where we blew through that this year, we're like forty billion dollars in the red. So um, that's going to be interesting to see how that gets resolved. But um, yeah, I am I am on the vice presidential uh, ticket with uh, Tom Ross. And you were talking about debates earlier. I just should mention real quick that uh, you can vote for the top six uh, candidates you want to see on the stage at. Uh, 
uh, a debate that's happening February 29th uh, in Hollywood, and it'll be an in-person debate. And you can actually go to freeandequal.org and you'll see Tom Ross on there. And he's the Transhumanist Party uh, presidential candidate. I'm his vice presidential candidate. Uh, you can vote for six, ranked choice voting. I voted for a couple greens on there along with uh, with Tom Ross. So there's like nine more days to vote. So anyway, uh, by way of digression, I was wanting to get that, that data point in. Um, uh, well, I wanted to ask really quick before John asks you a question. Um, what, so you, you are, you have been a political candidate. I was just wondering, like, um, what got y'all fired up to actually decide to run for office anyway? You know, it was, um, probably seen, uh, Trump get into the, the thing. I mean, I, I became an election volunteer and, 2016 and then and then I became a city council candidate in 2018 and 2020 and uh 2022 so something I'm going to plan to run again because now they've they've split the city into five districts so uh for a guy who's a dark horse candidate who's not really spending $80,000 <laughs> you know on the election like all the other candidates were uh, I think I've got a, a, a be better shot, a five times better shot, because instead of campaigning to an entire city of 120,000 population, now it's into five districts. So it's like one fifth the, uh, uh, you know, the burden of reaching out to the voters. Um, so that's good. That's going to be, uh, I guess, a lot of district, a lot of cities have gone from at large to district. Uh, and uh, I, you're a city council person yourself there, Josh, right? Yep, I was just elected in October. Wow, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I was like doubling votes every time I ran. Uh, you know, first I had like 400, then I had like 800, and then on the third time I thought, well, if I keep doubling, <laughs> you know, but I didn't I didn't double on yeah. on the third try. But um yeah, I'm planning to do do things around uh amateur radio and maker spaces and emergency response and uh, alternative currencies. I think there's there's a real way to do governance without governments uh, that we're not taking advantage of. So, yeah, I just, you know, I, I love uh, free choice and, and free people and, you know, informed people. So uh, I figure, hey, you know, I'm not getting any younger. I'll jump into the <laughs> fix in the political issues. Let me make a comment here. Uh, you, you mentioned in passing transhumanism. But everything that I've heard about it, I find to be horrifying. <laughs> uh, it's the Klaus Schwab, uh, Harari plan, the kind of uh, doing the the uh, the bidding of the billionaire class that has decided they don't need eight, seven or eight billion people in the world, and they want to get rid of most of us. And and so I'm quite puzzled how a green could be. Uh, uh, in favor. Maybe you can explain something that I haven't heard uh, as far as the, the transhumanist agenda, because uh, to me, it's the, the mortal threat, literally. Yeah, there's tons of like misinformation, malinformation, disinformation. Believe me, if you go to uh, transhumanist-party.org, you will not see anything about Klaus Schwab. I mean, he is not in our platform at all. Now, you know, transhumanism as a generalized philosophical movement is basically the idea of using technology to enhance the human condition, which humans wouldn't have lived a year without clothing. So anyone who uses clothes or cuts their hair with scissors or, you know, uses technology to augment their quality of life is a kind of transhumanist just just uh, out of the box. Uh, now, there are different stripes of transhumanists. There's faith-based transhumanists. I happen to be the faith-based uh, kind. I, I follow the work of uh, the Russian cosmist Nikolai Fyodorov, who talked about enlivening the cosmos and, and using technology to actually achieve the, the kingdom of God <laughs> kind of vision that you read about in many religions. And there are Mormon transhumanists. There's Islamic transhumanists. Yeah, it's just to, to say that they're all people who want to turn you into a robot or depopulate you. I mean, this is a common misconception, but it's a predominant one, I'm afraid, because the, the term is, has been just uh, conspiracized <laughs> all throughout the media for so long. That... Well, well, I have no objection to somebody like pacemakers and 
artificial uh, arms exactly. and you know things like that so people can that that part is fine but it's it's like the idea of of robots and ai replacing us uh forcibly <laughs> that that's very 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 troubling i don't know of anyone in the transhumanist party that's advocating for the forcible replacement now there might be some you know fringe people that say oh you know we should welcome our robot overlords and evolution is just a process of you know complexification and doing things more efficiently no matter what the substrate and that's a philosophical discussion but but to just say that uh anyone who uses technology to reduce suffering wants to turn you into a robot is is kind of an extremist or i i mean but that's it's an interesting uh, proposition, but there's, you know, philosophy has lots of propositions, but believe me, that's not the one that uh, the USDP okay. is pushing. Well, that, that's reassuring. Well, let's let's move ahead then. Josh, did you have a comment here? Well, well, yeah, I do have a comment. I'll say I do understand John's misconception. I decided to do a little little research my own, and I went on YouTube, and I said, all right, uh, I put in transhumanism, and the top uh, video was by the BBC. And they said the goal is to replace humanity with um, uh, robots, or you know, uh, and I mean, the, you know, they didn't give much time to describing what this is. But I, and I, uh, I certainly understand uh, people's misconceptions. And another video I watched with Joe Rogan was, "Oh, we're not going to have sex anymore." So, yeah, there's, you, you know, I mean, there's certainly. Uh, there's people with different ideas and there's probably some mis a lot of misconceptions depending on what your sources is. I, um, before we move on from transhumanism, I, I'm just interested, like, uh, how you got involved in this, uh, philosophy. Like, uh, well, what, what did I, someone um, did a friend of yours uh, say, check this out or what, how did you get into that? I, w I would say my older brother, who's sadly no longer uh, with us, but, uh, I moved into his room basically <laughs> as an infant and uh, he had just an amazing command of language and futurist ideas that he just, I was kind of like his, his mentor, I guess <laughs> he introduced me to uh, Buckminster Fuller, I think was a, a huge influence. If you look at the work of our Richard Buckminster Fuller uh, who lived uh, I think from 1899 to 1983, he was a proponent of making the world work for everyone and no one he called it omni advantaging uh no one living at the expense of anyone else and he he said that this is now possible to do with uh you know our current level of technology and uh it's just a matter of finding the uh collective will to institute these kind of dimaxian uh fuller-esque solutions you know he, he's uh, usually people say, oh, he's the guy that invented the geodesic dome, which is it's kind of true. You know, uh, he popularized uh, geodesic domes. But yeah, he, he was all about uh, doing more with, with less and, you know, achieving this omni-advantaging, you know, where we, we are all uh, taking care of everyone without uh, disadvantaging, hence the term omni-advantaging. And he advocated uh, living greed instead of weaponry. You know, <laughs> I mean, if we I mean, weapons has been a huge technological driver, but that doesn't mean we can't take the technology, technological progress and use it for a living, you know, uh, like the Green the Green Party. It wants uh, human-centered uh, values. And the Transhumanist Party wants uh, to put fact-based, evidence-based solutions instead of this duopoly warfare into politics. We should we should have a government that's that's increasing our quality and quantity of life you know i mean we don't have to take uh death uh as an inevitable uh, with the progress in longevity technology i mean tom isn't like huge hugely advancing the whole indefinite um longevity uh part of transhumanism he says it's too expensive <laughs> that's kind of funny uh uh, but there, you know, there's all just like there's all kinds of greens and all kinds of libertarians. There's all kinds of transhumanists. Um, so yeah, I grew up. Uh, my brother Paul, you know, introduced me to it is a Bucky Fuller, Arthur C. Clarke. Oh my gosh, uh, you know his his book Profiles of the Future was hugely influential, and you know all this uh, Marshall McLuhan. You know all these seminal books were being written in the in the mid '60s and. Uh, 
Um, okay, then I think we need to move on because of time constraints. That oh, sorry, us some I had to get back to on the answers. Yeah. Uh, Josh, you want to take it from there? Um, so a big reason we brought you on is uh, you're in the permaculture, and um, can you explain what uh, uh, what permaculture even is to the audience? Yeah, it's um, a well, the word is is sometimes called a, a, a portmanteau or a mix up a combination of words permanent and agriculture so uh it's been shortened to permaculture but it's it's really a um a design system that you can become certified in uh, you can become a you can get your pdc your permaculture design certificate by taking about a 40 hour uh, class from another certified permaculture designer and it's it's principles that uh are uh, there's 12 principles. I, I don't have them <laughs> memorized off the top of my head, but it's basically uh, how the indigenous uh, people treated the earth. They they didn't take uh, more than they needed, uh, so there was enough to regenerate. It, it's a very regenerative design system, and it's not just about growing plants. You can apply it to uh, to any anything uh, using uh, solutions that serve more than one purpose, uh, you know, conserving uh, energy. Um, anyway, uh, it's it's a great uh, design system. I'd encourage people to uh, check it out uh, more online. But uh, yeah, it, it, when I first heard about it, I thought, man, this is like uh, all the stuff I want to do, you know, reading the Mother Earth News, the whole Earth catalog, you know, <laughs> at a young age. I mean, it's like, why aren't we doing this? You know, <laughs> this is like the way we should be be uh, setting up our communities um so so how what's the relationship of this transhumanist party to green party uh you know we're, we're coming out of the 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 green party uh, background i've been a green for 34 years starting in hawaii and now back in maine uh so have you been or plan to be a green party or, or what's what's the connection well, actually, a very prominent uh, transhumanist, Natasha Vita Moore, ran on the Green Party ticket in Los Angeles uh, and and was elected to city council um, as a green. Uh, you know, so she's she's got very green uh, values. She runs the uh, H plus uh, organization, and uh, she's um, partner to um, Max Moore, who's a guy that's not so. <laughs> I, I I don't like all of his environment i don't think he's got all the best environmental uh stances but but yeah we do need to make this uh biosphere work and work for everyone we, we're not doing that now uh for sure um so that's an idea of uh you know transhumanists want to improve human life through technology and i think greens share that uh but I think the important important thing is we don't want our knowledge to exceed our wisdom, and I think that's that's happened right now, and that's why we're seeing these problems. So I'd like to see the knowledge and wisdom back in better alignment. And uh, okay, I think... I'd like to introduce a, a book that relates to that. It's called the uh, the uh, the Red Green Revolution by Victor Wallace, who's a longtime green himself. And it's the uh, the subtitle is the politics and technology of eco socialism, and uh, the uh, the that's kind of um, where he's coming from. He's he's a, he's a, a very good thinker, and um, by um, you know the the uh, by socialism, you know he's talking about that the traditional left orientation, class based, anti imperialist. Uh, and then on the, the, the uh, um, eco side, of course, a deep respect for nature and its processes, um, and and the, um, the the need to put uh, uh, everything before profit, not profit before everything. <laughs> in other words, profit's not bad in itself, but rather don't make it the goal at the expense of everything else. Yeah, I so, like Henry um, George's uh, idea to charge a land value tax and just run the whole. Oh yeah, yeah, we, that way. <laughs> but you know, he, that's kind yeah. of an eco-socialist uh, idea. If you, if you look, check out geoism or uh, Georgism. 
you can see that we could uh, get rid of a lot of this monopoly capitalist abuse that's going on around us. Yeah, there's many different crises happening all at once. Critical mass. So, uh, Daniel, um, you know, you said we do, uh, you know, uh, talking about um, politics, uh, you know, changing the earth. Like I, you, you stated that right now, a lot of what we're doing when it comes to, uh, you know, ch uh, changing the land or uh, maybe I'm not phrasing it right, but, uh, y you know, we do that, but not in the right way. Uh, perhaps uh, you can give us an example of, um, you know, ma uh, making the world a better place for human beings. Uh, like uh, I heard, I, I heard you're involved in this thing called permatrails. Can you, uh, can you just explain that to us? Yeah, I actually um, started uh, Permatrail as a nonprofit religious organization uh, last year in in California. It's it's still kind of in a, a pre and you know, uh, it's in a development uh, phase. But but the idea of that is uh, kind of an ambitious goal, and that is to uh, connect all the uh, greenways or uh, tra trails um, around the world by the 100th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which uh, happened in uh, 1948. So I thought, well, by 2048, we should have this interconnected permaculture trail system around the world, and it should have uh, all the human rights available on it, you know, freedom of uh, shelter and access to uh, movement and expression. And there was an article in Outside Magazine that actually had this as a cover story you know, uh, the, the top 25 challenges for the next uh, 25 years. I think it, it was, uh, I've got the issue. I think it's like 2008 issue, but they, they went in. One of the ideas was this, uh, they called it the uh, Phineas uh, Fogg slog. <laughs> you know, Phineas Fogg was the character in Around the World in 80 Days. So uh, if you could walk around the world, <laughs> that would be like the Phineas Fogg uh, trail. And they, they said it's about half built and, uh, it's just a matter of you know interconnecting these existing trails and and guaranteeing some kind of freedom to roam uh right which a lot of the nordic countries have uh freedom to roam there's something called uh the the king's right i think in in the british government where you know land on either side of a river is is okay to you know transit through and camp on you know just so you don't make a lot of noise or, <laughs> or mess things up um I think uh, Australia has a ver version of this, but uh, it, it's one of the human rights, basically, uh, freedom of movement. So it's like um, that should be like the top one, like like Tim Leary used to see, say, if you're not happy where you are, move. <laughs> you know, mobility is nobility. <laughs> and uh, it seems like we all have a right to life. And if you're in a situation which is threatening your right to life, get out of there, you know, move to a place where you can live better. And, you know, I had a friend uh, a couple of years ago, he hiked uh, a really great trail at the, you know, called the Pilgrim Trail in Spain, basically goes from like the foot of the Pyrenees. And he said he was able to just like eat free food, you know, like from, uh, um, you know, grapes and oranges and, and there were kegs of wine, you know, put out for the pilgrims. <laughs> so that's kind of the idea of a a permaculture trail right there there a little bit on, on the east coast we have the appalachian trail yes. it goes from like northern georgia all the way to maine yeah and there, it's, it's a challenge for people to go the whole length but some some do that it obviously takes quite a while to walk it but yeah. it's it's a, it's a very famous uh uh enterprise maybe that's not the right word but a, a structure and a challenge for people to to conduct yeah, we got the Pacific Crest Trail. I had a friend that that hiked that, uh, and there's a Trans Canada Trail. Uh, so there are these ambitious uh, trail trail connection projects already. But the problem with the one around the world is you're obviously going to have to bridge the Bering Strait <laughs> for for one. I but, like to I like to know how you managed to get to Hawaii, where I live. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that that'll be, that'll be a challenge unless you can walk on water. <laughs> well, you know, people that live full time on the oceans are, in in fact, uh, a kind of permatralian, <laughs> you know, because they can. Right. The well, the, the, the a water the planet. You can Polynesian. transit anywhere. Well, the, the ancient Polynesians, of course, navigated oh, from yeah. the Marquesas and Tahiti. There's this, and that's been revived. So there's now a, a new generation that have acquired this this 
this uh, total reliance on the stars and birds and cloud formation to navigate thousands of miles, which was done about a thousand miles, about a thousand years before Columbus went just the shorter distance from Europe to uh, the, to uh, what became the uh, the Americas. But it's like yeah, I heard they had guys that could lay on the deck and feel the water uh, ripple. Exactly. Sense. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. The, the the different currents and they took everything, but particularly the stars. They they really uh, had memorized the positions of stars, particularly the uh, the North Star, obviously being being the, the uh, a key factor here in in uh, direction. It's an amazing yeah. story, and then they've, they've rebuilt those basic on the drawings that people made um, in the uh, uh, when during the discovery by Western civilization. They did drawings of what the ancient canoes looked like, and they've since been replicated and and used by the modern navigators. It's, it's really a, a huge resurgence in that culture now, all through the Pacific. I see there's a question in the chat about oh, what is green, oh, I was gonna, green? Uh, well I did want to ask you something that oh, okay. um <laughs> so, uh, I didn't I didn't know if you were going to say more to what John was saying but um uh out, so the whole the whole project of this show is to y y you know we 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 discuss like what does it mean to be green like uh you know I I talk to people on the streets and you know I talk oh I'm in the green party and they say What's that mean? You know, it's it's not a well known thing. Uh, so, I mean, I, I wanted to ask you, what does it mean to be green to you? Yeah, I wish more people would put uh, give nature a seat at the table when they do things. You know, we we tend to think of everything as being human centric and like, oh, a human gives up this and gets that. But uh, if you don't have a seat for nature at the table. You're going to get a lot of stuff wrong, and and this is not the time to get stuff wrong because we've we've so stressed out the biosphere, the biodiversity. We've we've destroyed so much biodiversity. It's it's going to take everyone giving nature a seat at the table in their lives and in their businesses and in their souls, even you know, because uh, it's it's just a, a spiritual uh, kind of transformative thing to go into nature, uh, you know. I have a friend who's an artist. And let, let me add on to that. Yeah. I'd, I'd yes. like to add on my perspective a little bit. I'll try to keep it brief here. Uh, to, what does it mean to be green at, at this time? Uh, one is uh, to recognize that the federal government has forfeited trust. Mm. I think that's pretty fundamental. And number two, uh, they're, they're recognize that we have multiple ecological disasters that have derived from unchecked, a rampant industrialization by greedy corporations. <laughs> and, and then uh, as a result of that, it, it means to be a uh, need to pursue uh, and organize alternatives that are consistent with our four pillars of ecological wisdom, grassroots democracy, social justice, and, uh, and to do it in a, in a methodology that is nonviolent. So that, that would be kind of where I'm coming from, is what it means to be green. And, uh, one can think of more, but that's the start. Yeah, I love that you, you say nonviolent, because I think everything that we use uh, coercion and uh, involuntary means for, we could find a way to do it where it's it's non-coercive and, and is voluntary. Uh, yeah, I, I think just, you know, making making nature a stakeholder is, is just crucial because we've been ignoring uh, nature for so long. And I think the more we progress, the more uh, compassionate, hopefully, we get. And hopefully this is a a, a characteristic of, of minds, you know, the, the the smarter they become, the kinder they become. Uh, I, I choose to think that that's the case. <laughs> but I don't know if we could design an experiment to prove that or not. And we need to re re respect and possibly emulate the, the uh, the great wisdom of the native peoples over mm. centuries who have who have nurtured uh, the land and nurtured the, the processes of nature. In Hawaii, they call it malama aina, take care of the land. Aloha aina, love the land, which uh, the aina, literally that which feeds us. 
A-I-N-A is the Hawaiian word. So maybe Josh wants to comment as well. Um, you know, it's a struggle here. Like, I mean, we, uh, you know, uh, there's, we, we have, I, I live in uh, Northwest Alaska and a lot of the villages often depend on, uh, food from the, you, you know, it's expensive to get a plane and, uh, bring everything, uh, all the food you can have to the store. A lot of people depend on, you, you know, uh, the caribou on, you know, what they can get off the tundra and we're seeing the less and less, uh, you know, dwindling caribou herds, herds in this area. I mean, it, it, it's tough. It's, and unfortunately it's, um, you know, we don't all, we don't always keep the best policies to, you know, nurture that. Um, so I, I was uh, wondering, well, you know, uh, you said when you're talking about it, mean, what it means to be green, you know, um, it, it seems like people often, uh, well, I don't know how to say this, like uh, people are often stuck inside in offices. And I feel like uh, your Perma Trails uh, projects going to really uh, give people an opportunity to go back out in the nature. You know, I've heard like uh, there's such thing as a office brain and, uh, you know, a, well, I don't, I don't know what the opposite is. Uh, the outside brain, like your mind, is different when you're out in nature. So, uh, and you, you talked about like when you're on part of uh, doing this perma trails project is a, uh, you know, um, uh, it was part of a uh, this uh, human rights thing. Um, so, so uh, when someone goes on this trail, well, what are they? You know what. What what do you th what would they expect to see? You said there's gonna be uh, maybe shelter for people. Like, uh, what else is uh, part of this project? You know, my my sister uh, criticizes the idea of this this connected trail. She's like, that'd be terrible. You'd have like homeless people, and they'd be doing all kinds of disruptive, awful things. And so, yeah, I think you're gonna need some kind of uh, you know adult presence, <laughs> so to speak. You know, I think actually the amateur radio hobby would be. Uh, very interesting um, source of of um, supervision or or, or uh, what's the word facilitation. There's actually something called uh, parks on the air where um, people activate a park with uh, using making a contact while they're outside in nature in a park. There's summits on the air where they go to the top of the summit and they make a a Q, QSO or contact, and uh, that they, that's why they call um, amateur radio uh, in most of the world they call it radio sport. As it's uh, or the world's best hobby, uh, but I think this is an an interesting way that uh, you know transhumanism and green <laughs> philosophies could could maybe meet and help to create the perma trail. But but yeah, it's I'm not saying it's it's going to be a slam dunk, easy to solve problem about how to let people move anywhere they want and uh, and um, access their human rights. But it's always been a you know a struggle to to give each other uh, rights. They say. Rights are freedom and rights are the one thing you can't have unless you're willing to give them to others. <laughs> so I think that's kind of a, a one way to look at it. Uh, so well, um, you've been a radio host. Like, uh, can you uh, talk to us about that? How'd you get into that? And um, how, Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, that was like the best uh, decade of my life when I was doing uh, college radio. I uh, met, met a gal at a, at a libertarian supper club and, in Long Beach, and uh, we went on a date, and the first date was to go to uh, the radio studio, KUCI-FM, and uh, she had a show called the, the Love and Hate Show, which was kind of a, she had a co-host, Mr. Hate, and she was, her name was Love, <laughs> so they came up with a show named Love and Hate, <laughs> and, and it was, uh, they played music, but then we started doing public affairs, and I I signed up, got the training at the college station, which most college radio stations uh, will let you um, take the training. Um, some Sometimes you have to be a student at the college, but there was kind of a loophole at, at UC Irvine where uh, community members were included in the, the uh, training prospect. So I ended up doing a show on, on uh, industrial and medicinal hemp called Radio Free Hemp. And I did that for about... Uh, 1994 to 2001, I guess it was the longest running, <laughs> you know, hemp advocacy show, because actually I'd been involved in the uh, 
the California Marijuana Initiative. Uh, I think I went to the Survival Sunday at the Hollywood Bowl, getting signatures for the 1980 uh, CMI with uh, Jack Herrer and his Reefers Raiders. <laughs> you know, so we finally uh, pretty much have um, decriminalized and restored industrial hemp. Um, some places maybe have gone too far with the plant uh, freedom, <laughs> like. Uh, but uh, that's that's a city council resolution. There's something called the uh, the Oakland um, resolution that says that uh, prosecuting people using plant medicines should be the least priority of the local police force. And I think uh, hundreds of cities have adopted that um, resolution. Um, sadly, I, I lost all my um, recordings of my my show because I was kind of uh, unsheltered and uh, underemployed at the time and all the stuff was in a storage unit, got auctioned off. But um, that's another human right that uh, we need to work on is a, a universal basic income and, and access to uh, safe archiving. You know, I, I would actually upgrade our human rights to humane rights. I think it's time for a, uh, that kind of upgrade. But yeah, um, still doing radio and the fact that I've, <laughs> I am ham radio uh, extra class licensed uh ham but um uh, can you can, can you explain how what's what is ham radio exactly um yeah it's it's a peer-to-peer -a -peer communication system it's it's not broadcasting you know you turn on commercial radio you hear they're doing one to many kinds of this but the amateur radio service uh was almost not allowed to be in civilian hands after world war one there was a guy named Hiram Maxim that said, wait a minute, we want to be technological leaders. We got to let American experimenters develop this uh, this new new technology, this radio thing. And I think by by just one or two votes, the Congress said, OK, we, we won't let the military have exclusive <laughs> use of it. So that was a real victory for uh, kind of open source uh, civilian technology. And uh, is, is is ham an acronym? I never understood why they call it ham as opposed to, to pork or beef or whatever. Yeah, I think, I think it came it. from um, people doing Morse code. Some of them were really ham fisted the way they pounded out their Morse code, or or some people were like <laughs> hams when they talked on the air. So yeah, there's a couple different stories, but the the name stuck, I guess, at least in in America. But uh, yeah, it's it's amateur radio, the amateur radio relay league. Uh, it's kind of funny how that got started. Uh, the founder of that was, he needed a, he was living in, a, I think on the West coast and he needed a, a part from someone on the East coast. And back then to send a telegram, it was like a dollar a word or something. So he said, you know, screw that. I'll just, I'll just relay my message through a bunch of hams that I know that I want to buy this tube you know, from Connecticut. And, uh, so he, it was a, a way to send messages relay relay the messages like station to station. So the uh, ARRL was born and um, yeah, it's a great, great hobby. Um, I think, um, I think, you know, they, they do public safety work when the phone system goes down uh, in disasters. That's, those are the guys that can get, get messages through. And mm -hmm. I would love to see more people uh, get into it. There's another kind of thing where you don't need to even take a test. It's called the GMRS which is the uh, general mobile radio service. You just um, pay a fee. I think it's like uh, 35 or 60 bucks, and then you get your, your call sign. Um, and then, um, yeah, the little GMRS radio. It's like, I've got one here, a little uh, Baofeng um, portable handy talkie. Uh, and, like a walkie-talkie you know, then. Yeah, it's kind of, but it's a walkie-talkie that if it talks to a big station on a hilltop called a repeater, then your little five watt signal can be amplified and sent out anywhere the repeater can see. So mm -hmm. there's methods of linking these repeaters and you can actually talk basically around the world. So it's kind of like the permatrail of the air, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> well, I, I didn't like, um, I, uh, so I, I, I know, I know what ham radio is and I was just uh, asking you know, way so that our audience mm -hmm. can find out as well. I did, but I didn't know like, um, you were potentially able to talk to people all over the world. Like I've used it in mining operations and, you know, uh, sometimes like someone's too far away and like, uh, I can't talk. I, like, I didn't know there was that capability to be able to talk to people around the world with these radios. 
Yeah, uh, with the internet uh, and software defined radios, it's it's kind of reviving the hobby. I think um, usually it's uh, a bunch of <laughs> cranky old men <laughs> that are like doing it, but yeah, I think there's a real uh, infusion of interest in it, and you know, it's 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 kind of like an example of um, you know a voluntary government. I mean, we there's things like the International Telecommunications Union, you know, the International Postal Union. These these are ways that people end up cooperating, you know, without needing the, a gun pointed at them. <laughs> you know, so I think there's a good there's a good um, model there for um, doing cooperation in all segments of our life and at the community level. That's an interesting concept. Can you, uh, I mean, we're almost to the end of our program. So uh, what 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 is the voluntary government? Um, like, uh, do you mean like any organization where someone makes a governing body or something? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a, I guess you'd call it anarcho-syndicalism, where, you know, people form voluntary associations that can do all kinds of, you know, uh, mutual aid. So, and in the digital field now with, with blockchains, there's uh, distributed autonomous organizations, which are DAOs, and DAOs can be formed to uh, really accomplish any any shared, shared goal or purpose. Um, I'd, I'd like to see... This applied like uh, every block should have like a DAO that um, not only can do emergency response just for the, that little group of, say, it's 150 homes. In fact, this is how I'm planning to kind of organize my city council run is is to make identify each block, uh, call it by by the first two letters of the streets going around it. So you come up with these interesting <laughs> block block names and then have a, a little free library, have a cert contact uh, cert is the community emergency response teams it's a free training that you can get in case of disaster and mobilize these trained civilian responders i took the cert training here i didn't i didn't take the final exam it was a mass uh, casualty simulation at the airport but covid was breaking out and i'm saying yeah i really don't want to be <laughs> you know helping you know crisis uh, actors you know uh uh, with uh, the potential of getting COVID, so they were they were understanding. It's like, well, you still took the the first part of the training. So technically, I'm not all the way cert trained, but um, yeah, I think I think um, so you look at uh, churches, uh, community gardens, uh, you know, solar dividends is a great way. There's actually a plan to create a universal basic income by setting up community solar farms and pricing the power at a dollar a kilowatt. And then uh, putting the money in a trust fund when you turn 18, you've got this chunk of solar money. Um, actually, Bucky Fuller said the, the global money system should be based on the kilowatt hour of electricity uh, because that would be very stable and very um, friendly to civilization. So, yeah, I'll, we don't need a government to do these things. We could do do this through makerspaces and ham radio and, and cert trainings and um, solar dividends projects. So that's that's kind of uh, going to be my platform <laughs> when I when I run again, both at the local level and now I get to run at the national level as a transhumanist party vice president. So uh, I love uh, you're giving me all this platform <laughs> to, to help me get my ideas uh, nailed down better. Okay, well, uh, I think we'll kind of maybe wind it up here a little bit here. So we we'll well, appreciate yeah. your your being with us today, Daniel, and your project on uh, Perma Trail. I uh, mentioned already the, the, the Appalachian one. Apparently, there's one on the West Coast called Pacific Crest Trail. And the idea of connecting them all, or connecting people and more interaction uh, is always a good thing. And uh, I, I guess you're, you're, uh, you have a, a website here, permatrail.org. Is that correct? Yeah, that just points to a Facebook group uh, about the project. That, uh... Oh, Facebook. Okay. Okay. But right. I'm planning to put up a better yeah. full featured site at some point. <laughs> yeah, so Daniel, we like to end the show with this uh, thing called uh, called the action where we're you know we're if anyone's interested in being involved in projects or whatever we're doing, um, you know, this is where we say, all right, well, here's what and, and feel free to like plug anything like you know, we just talked about your website, like you if if people can find you on social media, um uh you, you know, um yeah, yeah, yeah. If you can tell us about that, it'd be great. Yeah, I guess uh, the 
transhumanist-party.org. That'll have information about uh, our platform, the USTP. The thing that we're really trying to get is is my running mate onto the stage for this uh, minor candidate debate. Uh, so that's going to be findable at freeandequal.org. Uh, Free and Equal has been doing a lot of stuff in the in this. Mm -hmm break to the duopoly <laughs> kind of political space, which a green green party people should should be um well familiar with. Jill Stein is on the on the roster of candidates at there at free and equal dot org. So um you might throw Tom Ross in your your six way ranking uh if if you want. Um so yeah that's and then permatrail.org if you want to um learn more about uh this this permaculture trail, <laughs> human rights interconnection idea. But the most time critical one is this uh, debate. I think there's only like nine days left to uh, before they close the voting. And um, they're only going to let the top six be on the stage. So it'd be it'd be really great to see Tom Ross out there. So he could dispel some of these myths <laughs> about uh, the evil transhumanisms, transhumanists, <laughs> because I really don't think... Um, Klaus Schwab is the face of transhumanism, but it's too bad that uh, a lot of people get that impression. So those and, uh, and, and yeah, so and, that, that's for the free and equal debates. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's the one happening uh, February 29th. So leap day. <laughs> it's kind of, uh, so mm -hmm. I mean, we we got a couple minutes. Like, why don't you explain how people like uh, you you will be on the stage? So it's what's their website and how do they vote in this thing yeah uh just um it's a pretty easy process you just need a, a u.s phone number uh and you go to free and equal dot org and it, it'll explain it'll show you the roster of candidates well it sends you a code to your phone to verify that um uh, you know you're not spoofing the system they're not going to use your your phone number for anything so don't worry about the privacy uh violation <laughs> issues but um, yeah, and there's a running a running tally of the results. The, they update it in real time. Um, it'd be great if uh, we could do more <laughs> more governance with these kind of you know uh, verified real time uh, decision systems. Deliberative uh, democracy is you know it's it can always improve. You know we have to be. There's a word. Uh, I think uh, ikagi in Japanese, it means uh, continuous improvement or always improving. Um, I think that's kind of what the American experiment is supposed to be, <laughs> a continuously improved uh, experiment in consent of the governed. And uh, the key word there is consent. <laughs> well, uh, thanks for joining us, Daniel. And uh, audience, be sure to check it out and um, be sure to participate in this uh, poll and equal uh so yeah if uh for any updates on me the easiest thing to do is go to www.joshuajhadley.com um all my uh links are in there and i'll be sure to update that green party stuff uh i need to do that um and for me uh i'm on the city council and we just had we're going we have an ordinance to update our fee schedule and they want to, the city wants to, uh, the administration is pushing that we not have, um, y you know, itemize or itemize the uh, uh, fee updates and say they just want to do flat, make it very easy. But uh, I did say yes to a public hearing that's going to be on February 1st. Uh, Anyone in Kotzebue, uh, be sure to come by and make uh, comments on this hearing. It's, uh, you know, the the meeting start at five fifteen. You can call in. Um, the information is mm -hmm. gonna be posted all around town at all the stores and you know the post office. If anyone's looking for the number, um, and yeah, I that's my that's my call for for action this mm -hmm. week. And um, I believe we have another week before that. I'll certainly repeat all this and john was there anything i know you got that book john why don't you uh talk about that um yeah yeah hold it up again yeah this is this this one here have we got time to for, for a couple of quotes from it yeah okay there's uh there's three short quotes i'd like to do here um uh, 
Let me see now. Let me get that back. Give me a second here. 182. This is uh, it just give you the flavor of it here. Uh, let's see now. The only way to end class, okay, the red is the, the basic, you know, class analysis that, that people are pretty familiar with coming out of the Marxist tradition. And then the green, of course, is, you know, our green orientation that we have as Green Party members. The only way to end class domination is to dissolve the class that dominates. There's no evidence that this class will dissolve itself. Individual members may repudiate their affiliation with the class, but for the class as a whole to be dissolved in its most intransigent members must be stripped of their power. This is what the eclectic notion of multiple co-equal lines of oppression fails to recognize. And by that, he's referring to, you know, uh, the, the uh, gender issue uh, and, and uh, race issue uh, and class issue. And he says what he's saying here is that the class one is, is actually the foundation that needs to be uh, addressed as central. And here, um, a social class is being treated as essentially a personal trait. Uh, belonging to the capitalist, capitalist class means more than just possessing certain cultural traits. It means being implicated, whether actively or not, in the exercise of power over the rest of society. And one further quote here. It's one thing to recognize and another thing to draw the indispensable um, to draw the indispensable majority into the struggle to achieve it. Part of that task consists in relating to the overarching ecological goal uh, in relating the overarching ecological goal to popular aspirations at every level. Another part consists of developing a political mechanism, a political force that can embody and enforce the collective interest. Yet another involves discovering, explaining, and advocating, and applying all the measures needed in order to slow down and where possible reverse the dangerous environmental trends. So that kind of gives you a little bit of the flavor, you know, fusing the two into a great synthesis of these two major intellectual traditions. So I'll wind it up with that. Well, um, th thanks for that, John. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're uh, we're joined by Daniel <laughs> Daniel T. The this uh, uh, Green for Life is hosted by me, Joshua Hadley. My co-host is John Olson. It, our uh, producer is Robert Shields, and we have Justin Belanger at the booth. Uh, we're on YouTube, every, we're on the Green Party of Alaska's YouTube page every week. We're going to look into uh, going on to more platforms, but uh, we upload this uh, every Monday morning. So uh, if you want uh, to uh, check us out, be sure to subscribe. And um, if you want a notification, hit that bell and uh, <laughs> have a good rest of your day. Thanks again. Live long and prosper. Aloha from Maine. Prosper,